Okay, so welcome to Modern Frequency, and um, we're going to dive right into it. You're Will Daly, Daly, obviously, and you have a podcast called Sound of Our Town. Can you tell me more about it? Yeah, um, I was approached by my friends at Double Elvis. They have a podcast called Disgraceland, uh, super successful, uh, wonderful show about possibly doing... Um, a podcast about live music in each city, almost right. almost like Anthony Bourdain, but you just swap out food with live music. Nice. And we conceptualized this whole thing in 2019. And then for obvious reasons, it was put on ice. And uh, but our first season came out last year and our second season is, is out now. Uh, the Milwaukee episode just came out yesterday. We have um, Providence, Rhode Island, Milwaukee. And we got uh, 10 other cities coming out this season. And it's just what is happening and where do you go if you roll into this town? Mm -hmm. What does the music of the city say about itself? And almost just like a starter kit for rolling in and having an authentic experience. I mean, we are Starbucks and Dunkin' Donuts in this world. You know, I travel everywhere playing music. And nothing depresses me like when I'm in Europe and see a Kentucky fried chicken. You know, it's just like, I want to be somewhere and be there. Right, you know? right. And I feel like live music right now still has the responsibility to tell our stories as it should. And it's really hard to corrupt that. You know, you can shut down a club and then another one's just going to pop up. Right. So people of that community can start telling their stories and connect with one another. And not try to connect with the whole world, which we we all have in our hands right now, inauthentically. Mm -hmm. It's almost like this show. I, look, we don't need another podcast in the world. But this show is almost like a podcast about getting out there with each other and engaging in this ancient ritual of live music. Very cool. Um, you dive into every city's or every town's um, scene. You're originally from Boston. What's the scene like there? It's wild because we have a great music history. Uh, we have a, a cultural history here. And we Boston has a strange attitude of being a big, small city, being an important American city, but not being actually that big. It's getting a lot bigger. But um, there is this little chip on its shoulder in this town. And uh, there's no industry here or anything ton of college students so there's always a weird kind of, of mix in, in our music with that um but the indie music scene the hip-hop community here um the indie rock history here uh is very rich and i will say the the cats here you know the players like um my friend kevin berry's out with jackson brown uh my friend duke levine is out with bonnie Raitt. These guys are some of the best guitarists in the world. And when you call Boston home, I think it says something some, something about you and your dedication to your art because you don't want to go to those hubs where music is this churning industry. You want to be in a city like, like Boston, like Seattle, like Milwaukee, like Chicago, where music is is connected to the people in the soil there not so much an, an industry that is i don't know i don't want to say anything bad about the music industry it's just keeps keeps your soil separate from you know the harvest <laughs> of what, what grows and only worries about growing you know that's well put yeah i, I agree with you <laughs> um your music is reminiscent of uh pete yorn to me was or is he an influence on you if not who is Absolutely. I love Pete Yorn. I'm going out with the Wallflowers, you know, this month there, you know, Jacob's an influence, Wallflowers an influence. Um, you know, all the, when you grow up as I like from nineties and the aughts and everything like that, you're exposed to everything. And sometimes for influence with music, we always, you know, you always get asked this question about influence with music. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'm influenced by things that I don't like more than the things I like. Really? You know? When you, when you hear things you don't like, um, and this happens in every, I want to say, genre of music, you know, whether it be rock or hip hop, um, folk, Americana, all these things. As soon as it gets tired 
as soon as it gets templated uh, and cookie cutter or whatever it is, um, a bone of me just gets like angry or something. And I'm influenced to go like into the deep end of, of what I feel is the deep end for me. Mm -hmm. um, but I love, you know, all the classics that were bestowed upon me as a child, whether it be Joni Mitchell, Bob Dylan, Led Zeppelin, The Police, everything, all that music is to me a renaissance and the renaissance is over, you know, and, and now we're all basking in its light. Um, and all the way, you know, Van Halen to uh, just so many, so much great music before, I don't know, before we, we could all just do it at home. Right, you know? right, right. Um, you had to be a little bit insane to try to get through that eye of the needle and to be that insane and, and hardworking and dedicated to it. Great art squeezed out of that. Right. And, um, but you know, I also love in Soundgarden, Pearl Jam and Nirvana were huge influences for me. Oh um, yeah, sure. Sure. And like, uh, I think Eddie Vedder is like a, not just a songwriter and performer, but as a ethical artist and the ethics of how they conduct themselves artistically. Um, and then modern, modernly, uh, I love Rufus Wainwright. I think he's incredible. Just I kind of look to him musically as this inspiration of, as a composer. So, mm -hmm. and then all over the place. And I love Kendrick Lamar and, and right now and who else I, I could go on and on i got i also just listen to a lot of jazz when i'm home that's pretty much it i saw the old jazz that's very cool, very cool. you mentioned you mentioned the wallflowers how yeah. did that tour come to fruition um i was playing on a, a fest and met jacob dylan and it was almost magical i uh met him we're hanging and i was sitting with my friend g love and I, I was I got on stage you love and played a little and then I'm chatting with Jacob and it was like, cool and, uh, fest is over I'm like I don't go say goodbye to Jacob had a nice nice conversation I go up to his bus and I turn the corner we're in, we're in Maine and like I think Portland Maine and I get to his bus and he's standing out front talking to this, this this woman and I walk up and I go hey man and the woman goes oh my God Will Daly I was like like I like I gave her a hundred bucks to be like look I'm gonna walk up and when I walk up you need to freak out. You know, and so I walk and she goes, well, I listen to your song Sunken Ship every morning. I get up and I put the video on while I'm getting ready for work. And I, and and she just goes, she's going on and on. I'm just trying to say goodbye. And he's kind of laughing like, what the heck? Like, dude, you, this, this is like your biggest fan right here. I, I didn't know. It's like it was like my mom set this up to just like, <laughs> and, you know, and uh, so then we go to play the next town on this fest. And I'm sitting in again with G-Love and see Jacob and he's like hey man good to see you we'd start talking he's like so I listened to that song last night and man I just dig it so much and we then we just talked forever and caught up and so I that's how we became friends and I opened up a bunch in 2019 and I'll tell you this man I've been doing this for 20 years this whole thing put out uh, almost 20 years ago 19 years ago I put out my first record on my own you know just burning cds and yeah, putting yeah. it in like selling it show to show back trunk and uh, I've never, I've played with, you know, all my heroes, Farm Aid, played with Vetter. I've, I've done, I've never had an agent. I've, all my shows have booked like just through grunt work or friends calling and people calling me to open up. No agencies ever come to me. I've been signed with labels and stuff like that, but that was kind of a nightmare. And I kind of like operating. Independently. Yeah. And to the beat of my own drum, no well, pun intended, actually. <laughs> and and it just seems intrinsic, too, to not actually get sucked up into those systems to feel like I'm free artistically at the same time. Yeah. What I do love is like when I did some dates with the Wallflowers on the East Coast. All right. There's always pockets of people who know me in those rooms. And the other like 80 to 90% are like, who the hell, why are, why are 10% of this room going crazy with this guy who just walked out? And I get to, you know, play and introduce my music without any narrative before me other than the music. Mm -hmm. You know, 
I think John Mayer is amazing. You know, he's so talented and, but bef- and he's, he's an insane musician. Sometimes John Mayer enters the room before the music does though. Because how can you avoid it? You know, sometimes whatever is hit, you're not listening to the music he's doing in the moment. You're listening to like, is he going to play the hit song that I know? Right. Or who's he dating right now? Right, <laughs> or right, right. It, all that I have to go on other than, a, you know, is this like really hardcore group of fans, which I love. And I pick up new fans every year. It's great. And it, I don't know, I'm, I think I'm at the most peace with it I've ever been. Because you're always being told what you're not in this business. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I know. Now I finally know, like, oh, this is everything I am. You know, I'm not, I don't ever, the idea that I would allow in what I'm not anymore, which is industry always tells you what you are. Oh, no, you know. True, true, true. Uh, you mentioned some of the greats. Um, How does it feel to share a spotlight with legends like Eddie Vedder and, and, and Neil Young? You were on, you're on stage with Neil Young too, right? We, I was on stage with Willie Nelson, um, and but Neil, I like have been on like st- we danced to the Pretenders together on the side of the stage, you know, like my first time. I, it's um, it's weird how like I want to. I'm such an ind- like I'm an independent artist. I'm not a household name, you know. And the people who know me know me, you know. And the people who share my music share my music passionately so it's strange to have these really profound experiences while you're not in this like five to one percent of things you know of this this professional artist world and sometimes i think you know late at night when brain starts to wander maybe toxify itself a little bit if it's not at peace i'll think yeah I danced on the side of the stage with Neil Young while watching The Pretenders. We shared a couple laughs, but I never like got to record a song with him. Mm. <laughs> what are you doing? Like, you know, why would I do that to myself? And I feel we all do that to ourselves. You know, we don't, we never let it be enough. And um, so I'm, I practice making sure that when I'm lost, I think, just remember that time when you were, I can almost get choked up talking about it, like standing on the side of the stage watching Chrissy Hines be magical and you're just rocking back and forth and dancing and smiling with Neil Young because he wanted to watch her just as much as you did. Yeah, it's a moment in itself, so. Yeah. Right, right. And and Eddie Vedder was like, is my, my spirit animal, you know, and um within 15 minutes of meeting him, he was like, hey, why don't you come and play with me at Soundcheck? And and who, and for the person who you did look up to, and for the person who did kind of light the way for you artistically, behaviorally, musically, you know, introduced you to Fugazi, Neil Finn, you meet them and 15 minutes later, you just, for me, I'm just like, oh, I'm on a bill with Eddie Vedder, I won life. And I get to watch Soundcheck. I'm on the top of the world. And 15 minutes later, why don't you come up and play elderly woman behind the counter in a small town and rock it in the free world. And the kids are all right with me. And then, you know, he's been great to me ever since. And uh, that's just the one, it's a, I don't know. It's a, it's a strange path that I'm on. And I feel like so much of my music and the career aspect and even like, you know, the podcast is instilling my job is music is something I'm going to do no matter what, Mm -hmm. but my job is communication and making sure that when I'm performing or talking about music, that I'm accessing the part of our existence that needs music to keep us connected and free and that's the job of it all and um all the constructs of music industry and uh spins to sales to it, it, spins are no different than radio charts 50 years ago or whatever right all that is um not 
not my job. <laughs> right. You know, and 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 the times when those things go well for me or I'm on billboard or something like it never feels as good as getting up on stage or with someone like that or having someone talk to me at the end of the night and say how much that show or that song meant and why and how and specifically to them that is profoundly more rewarding and powerful than any of the constructs we do for for the business of art sure sure i, I would imagine you know um how's the new album coming along you're you're in the process of making a new album is that correct i am i am I, i'm i'm definitely doing too many things at once but it feels really good and i feel really um grateful to be so busy after the last three years um we cut a couple songs you know post pandemic put a couple of them out uh and I just said, look, if we're going to make a full length, a full length is such a weird thing. And releasing releasing music right now is like throwing something into an abyss and asking people to click on it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and a lot of art now and a lot of music can be made by, hey, I wrote, here's my here's my demo of it. I'm going to send it to a drummer in Seattle, bass player in L.A. No one meets, no one hangs out. I said, if I'm doing a record, we all got to be in the same room eye to eye and so in march we went and did five days and, and um and then again uh in in may and then we just finished up last night another two days straight so we're just like carving out two days when everyone can be in the same room mm -hmm. together and no one can work out this at home alone on a laptop um we have to be be in the mix together and um it's coming out great um i'm excited for it uh it, i just laughed when you asked because i i like right before we started this interview i had a phone call with my all the people i'm working with and i was like okay last two days are great i'm gonna shut my brain off and we'll talk next week about it and go through it but uh we started with 14 tunes and we've kind of whittled it down to 11 and gonna try to finish it up with september with all like you know the tour that i have coming up and okay. other yeah. things about i'm excited for it that was my next question when is it going to be released that's a great question um i i don't want to say okay. but i will say this like there's that i did a song last year called easy to be around and if you go to easy to be around on spotify or apple or wherever you listen to stream music there's a track too and track two is easy to be around credits yeah. where I it's an instrumental of the song where I read off everybody involved in making it. Oh, cool. Because it's again, like what goes back to like, what's my job and the connectivity, the connectivity of the people involved in making it. Because as soon as this goes out into the abyss, it's almost like they're erased. And it's like, Will Daly put out this song, but I didn't do it alone. Right, right, right. And and I want anyone who maybe took the time to listen to that track too and wonder what that was to feel like, to realize how much work and all the people involved and, and what it takes to, to do it. And and then I have this $10 song concept, mm -hmm. song that we recorded. The song is like this seven minute piece. And I was like, if I throw this song in the abyss, someone's going to get a text message before the song's over and get distracted. And I don't want that to happen to this song. And I, I sat there and I shelved the song for 10 months because I kept saying, I'd rather just play this for my friends one at a time. Right. But wait, I can do whatever I want. <laughs> we can do whatever we want. I don't have to put this online. And it's not like a anti-digital platform thing. It's a pro listening thing. So the $10 song at all my shows, you come up, you pay whatever you want. The suggestion is $10 because if you pay $10 to listen to something at a merch table, on headphones, on a disc man for only once in your life, you're going to have a different experience listening. So between easy to be around in the credits, the $10 song, and the way I think I'm going to release this next album, which I'll share with you when it comes out, like we'll do this again. Mm hmm definitely 
I'm, I'm continuing this conversation of just like, I just want to do things with responsibility to the process and to the listener and to myself. Like there's a compassionate way to do all this and not worry about what I'm making on streaming or anything. And with so far with the song that I have, mm -hmm. the $10 song, it's called Cover of Clouds. Um, and it's about, actually it's about that piece of artwork right there, Joni Mitchell, she painted that. And oh. it's the cover of the album Clouds. And the song is called Cover of Clouds. And it's not a cover of clouds. It's really confusing, but, <laughs> but uh, it's kind of a meditation on, on her artistry. And I'm having a wonderful experience because it's happening at my merch table. Two to 12 people a night can really get in there on a seven minute song and find a quiet corner to listen. And there's a journal that goes along and people write in it afterwards. They're just like, hey, they draw pictures, whatever they want. And it's almost like the slow food movement, but for music. You know what I'm saying? Yep. It's not going to get a million spins. But by the end of this year, maybe even maybe I just keep it on there all next year, too. Maybe it stays with me forever. Maybe that book fills up. And a couple thousand people listen to this song. But those thousand people have something special that happened to them. Right. I, even the dude is like, yeah, that was cool which happens to the fan is like, this is your best song. Can't believe I'm so pissed to someone who didn't even know me. This woman started weeping because she just felt that it's so wonderful to listen to something and know that you made it. And I'm the only one listening to it right now. Right. Right. We're having this connection, like, I, you know, as intended and as, I didn't mean to, for her to cry, but she just really got it and really needed it in that moment. You know, and um, and that's how art should be. It should have to do to be like, yeah, it's cool to the person who's like, this is the greatest thing ever. Right, <laughs> you know, right, 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 right. It shouldn't be, it shouldn't be here like, hey, that's great. This is a great song. We all love it. I don't want to make that kind of music necessarily, you know. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess that's my long form answer. Like, when's the album coming out? When it's done? And then in a way that complements this kind of practice that i'm cultivating mm -hmm, mm -hmm. how do i connect better with people even if it's less people you know, as, as long as you reach one person i think that's you did your job you know right. I mean? yeah and if one person you, that's wonderful and if it's a hundred it's even more wonderful and if it's a yeah. thousand you know, and sometimes if it's a million it gets really weird it does because there's nothing about us chemically or spiritually is a species that's like yeah i really want to be you know i think it's, pro it's probably amazing to be in front of a hundred thousand people it's like i think it was i think it was tina turner who, who might still have the i think maybe for a female artist she has the largest crowd ever it's like three hundred thousand in brazil oh maybe yeah i'm sure that's just astounding but is it a musical experience at that point i don't know you know it's like a right I don't know what happens to the human brain when it thinks it's in, I don't know. I'm a, I, I, I've played stadiums and I kind of, it gets in my head when I play a theater and I can see, every, you know, the, the faces of everybody, even up in the back, back balcony. It's mm -hmm. like, okay, that makes, that makes sense to me in a, on the human scope of things. <laughs> right, 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 right. Um, well, I wish you success with um, the Wallflowers tour. Thank you. And thank you for doing this for, with me. I appreciate it. My pleasure. And hopefully I'll see you out there somewhere in an in intimate setting. That would be great. Absolutely. And uh, I'll see you soon. All right, man. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Bye.